Now God, for these next few minutes, anoint these lips of clay, let me say something of value to your people. God, use me up until I am no more. Let them hear what you have to say through me, God. I'm just a mouthpiece waiting to be used. Have your way, God. Have your way. Have your way. Oh, Lord, you are my strength and my redeemer. Let everyone say amen, amen. and amen. We certainly do thank God for his mighty move of coming by and just walking through the pews and walking through the aisles and just giving the people their joy. Amen. Very quickly, I do want to give honor and respect to our leader, Superintendent William R. Ephraim, everyone on the clergy, District Missionary Kenita Smith, and everyone in their respected uh, places. We do want to give honor and respect to you. Amen. Uh, very quickly, if you would please turn with me to the book of Eph um, Ezra, the fourth chapter, the fourth and the fifth verse. We're going to move through this, through this word. Amen. That's the book of Ezra the fourth and the fifth verse and if you have that we ask that you do stand in reverence of God's word amen that's the book of Ezra the fourth chapter the fourth and the fifth verse amen we're going to touch on this briefly and then we're going to be on our way amen amen the Bible says then the people of the land weakened the hands of the people of Judah and troubled them in building and hired counselors against them to frustrate their purpose. All the days of Cyrus, king of Persia, even until the reign of Darius, king of Persia. Amen? Amen. Look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, neighbor. Let, no let no one frustrate your purpose. Frustrate purpose. Amen. You may be seated in the presence of God. When we speak of purpose, we speak of something set up. As an object to be attained. Amen. When you think in terms of reaching your purpose. Obtaining that purpose. Preparation is always needed. Amen. Amen. Preparation is the, act, is the action or process of making things or something ready for use or service or getting ready for some occasion. Mm -hmm. When you have a purpose it is necessary first of all to prepare. But I must serve notice to you right now that even though you prepare to obtain your purpose, there will always be a negative side that will attempt to frustrate or to defeat your endeavor, mm -hmm. to induce feelings of discouragement, to bring nothing to make invalid of or of no effect, to nullify. Just because you have a purpose and you think you're prepared, don't think that there will not be negative forces that will attempt to frustrate your purpose. Amen? Amen. Very quickly, uh, Satan will always attempt to frustrate your purpose. If you don't believe me, ask Moses. Well, what was his purpose? His purpose was to deliver Israel from 430 years of bondage and slavery down in the land of Egypt. But although he had been born to a Hebrew family, and he was reared up as the grandson of Pharaoh, he also had the benefit of watching and observing and living like a prince on the Egyptian side while also being tutored by his real birth mother in the religion of the Hebrews on the other side. Forty years old, he saw an Egyptian fighting with a Hebrew and he decided, this is my time. He then kills the Egyptian buries his body in the sand. He doesn't really know how he's going to bring to fruition that which he was born to do, but the next time he attempted to counsel two Hebrews, they themselves said, do you intend to kill us like you did that Egyptian? Uh, and he recognized that when he had done, what he had done was not a secret. He also recognized that the people whom he was born to deliver was not ready for him yet. Sometimes you get prepared and you're ready to do the job, but you find out that the people are not ready for you. You know, that's, that's called being born before your time or a little bit earlier before your time. Amen? So he has to go into Midian 40 years. He was only 40 years when he thought he was going to be the deliverer. But because his plan, his purpose was frustrated, it took him another 40 years. When he comes back at age 80, 
he was engaged in additional preparation and although he is consistently being discouraged on one side, he knew God well enough that it didn't matter what happened, he was determined that his purpose would be fulfilled, amen? So in the midst of your scholastic achievements, you must also have some spiritual preparation. That when the enemy attempts to frustrate your purpose, you will be able to draw from a reservoir of spiritual strength and enrichment that will give you what you need in order to bounce back. Somebody say bounce back. Uh, don't think that you're not going to get knocked down because you are. And it's no crime to get knocked down, but you've got to have something in you that tells you to get up and bounce back. Just another one. Um, in the book of Ezra, it precedes the book of Nehemiah. Now both Ezra and Nehemiah, they had a similar task. The southern kingdom of Israel, the kingdom of Judah, they have gone into, cap into captivity in the land of Babylon. And they were there for 40 years. But God, who is able to touch the hearts of those who you think have no relationship with God, he's able to do it. The children of Israel, they then go down into the southern kingdom of Judah. They go down into Babylon and they are there underneath the reign of King Nebuchadnezzar. But what happened is King Nebuchadnezzar, he gets lifted up in pride. God, all, God allows his kingdom to be divided. He was all right, and, you know, he did a lot of things, but, and, you know, God did not bring him into judgment. But one night, he had a drunken ball using the holy vessels that have been captured from the holy city, from the temple in Jerusalem. And he took those holy vessels, put them in the temple of his idol god, and while he was in the midst of a drunken celebration, he told somebody, go get those vessels that were taken from the temple in Jerusalem. He then proceeds to pour his wine into those vessels and he starts to drink out of the vessels that have been set apart for the use of Yahweh, uh, Jehovah, Israel's God, amen? And while he's drinking out of one of those vessels, God allowed the fingers to begin to write on the wall. Now say what you want, the man is drunk. Uh, and it would have been astounding if he had seen the arm, the torso, the head, and the entire body. But God didn't let him see anything but his fingers writing on the wall. Right. He gets frustrated. Wait a minute, wait a minute. What, what is that? Somebody come read this writing. And, it's, and the strange thing about it is when God writes, the devil can't read it. Uh, all of the magicians and the astrologers, they tried to read the writing, but they could not read it. Somebody said there was one by the name of Daniel. He has on him the wisdom of the God of heaven. Now, it is important because it doesn't matter whether you get your bachelor's degree or your master's degree or your Ph.D. Whatever you get, retain the wisdom of the word of God. Because you're going to get into some situations where there may be people who are more highly educated than you from a secular point of view. But God is always going to let a situation arise where there will always be somebody who needs to know the mind of God and who is going to interpret what is going on. So here comes Daniel. You know, nobody else could read the writing. Daniel looks at it and he says this. Is this, what you, is this what you want me to read? Yeah, that's what we want you to read. And Daniel looked at it and he says, well, it just says many, many TKL, you farseem. Uh, it just says that you are weighed in the balances and you are found wanting. It also says that God has numbered your kingdom and finished it. And it's going to be given to the Medes and the Persians. And before Nebuchadnezzar knew it, in comes the Medes and the Persians, and they captured his kingdom, and they ended up with, instead of a Chaldean king, they ended up with a Persian king. And this Persian king was by the name of Cyrus. He comes along later, and he was not, you know, he wasn't the first one to come behind Nebuchadnezzar, but he then comes along a few years later after they've been enslaved for 70 years. And the first thing that's put in Cyrus's heart is the God of Israel has placed it in my spirit to rebuild the temple. 
Uh, when he, uh, uh, when Nebuchadnezzar invaded Judah, he tore down the temple. First off, he took all of the holy vessels out of the temple. And then when King Zedekiah rebelled against him 11 years later, he went back and destroyed the temple. He also tore down the walls around the city of Jerusalem. So he says that God has put it in my heart to rebuild the temple. So when he asks, who is there left among thee, the children of Judah, those of the tribe of Judah and those from the tribe of Benjamin that's ready to go back and build the temple of the Lord. Some volunteers stood up and he said, now, those of you who are from the hometown, those of you that are not going, we want you to kind of finance their trip. We want you to kind of give them some offerings. Amen. And one by the name of Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, is named governor of Judah, and he is sent to rebuild the temple. Cyrus calls for Sheriff Beza, and Sheriff Beza said, listen, 70 years ago, Nebuchadnezzar took the vessels out of the temple in Jerusalem and said, I want you to now take all of this stuff and put it back in Jerusalem. Put it back in the temple where in the temple where it was stolen from. Seventy years their stuff was down in Babylon. Seventy years it was in the house of an idol god. But after seventy years, God raises up a heathen king and makes him give all of that stuff back. I tell you, sometimes it looks like the devil has taken everything from you that is worth having. But it doesn't matter if God gives it to you. It doesn't, you don't have to worry because the time will come when the enemy will give it back. He may take that which is yours and you feel frustrated and you feel like you're about to give up, but you won't, and that you won't have your rightful possession. But I'm here to tell you that God will make the devil give it back. I wish somebody said, give it back. Now listen here, uh, when Ezra gets back to Judah, he gets together the people and they start to rebuild the temple. And after they start to rebuild the temple, some critics, uh, they don't want to see it happen. They decided that they would try and sabotage the work by diluting the strengths of those men of Judah. They said, we do not believe in that. We do believe in the same God that you believe in. And we'd love to help. But he knew that this was just a trick. Somebody say just a trick. See, if the enemy can dilute you, he can weaken you, and you and the, you know, you, those of you that's going to be in the educational process, you know, the day that the emphasis was really on the middle school graduates, and many of you middle school graduates, or those of you that are going to be graduating from high school, going on into college, they're going to try to dilute who you are. Uh-huh, they're going to make you, you know, when they put you in philosophy, they're going to start trying to make you think that God doesn't even exist. They're going to come to you with a whole lot of different philosophies and teachings that are going to be diametrically opposed to everything that you've heard in church. And if the enemy can get you to stop believing that there is one seated somewhere up there in a, on, on the throne, you know, I don't know where heaven is, but I do know that it does exist. And I know that he is the one that created the heavens and the earth. And, you know, he is the one that created us and the stars and the moons and the galaxies and the suns and stuff like that. And I'm not going to let anybody dilute my faith because, you know, when they dilute your faith and they dilute your purpose. It kind of messes things up in your mind. But you see, God is trying to get you into your purpose, but he wants you to come in as a whole man, as a whole woman, as one believing in God, saying, my job is to build the temple of God in the hearts of men. They said, we believe in your God. And I hear Zerubbabel saying, no, 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 we don't need your help. We're going to build this temple. And what do they do? They hire counselors to mingle in among the people and to frustrate their purpose. It's a little bit different in Nehemiah's case. When Nehemiah came back, his purpose was not to rebuild the temple, but to build the wall around the city. And there was one by the name of Sanballat and one by the name of Tobiah. They tried to frustrate them in building the wall by saying, look, 
Look, look at how rickety this thing is right here. If a fox run across it, that thing would surely fall. But Nehemiah took his position, held his head high and say, I am doing a great work. Everybody may not understand what God is doing in your life and they may not understand God's purpose in your life. And, you know, before you get all the ends together, you know, they they might look at you and be like, man, what you're doing is a little shaky. What you trying to do? I see this right here. You only got the foundation laid. But I'm here to tell you that if the purpose is ordained by God, all you got to do is keep working and don't let the enemy frustrate your purpose. Coming down to a close, Satan even tried and attempted to frustrate the purpose of Jesus. Well, what was his purpose? The Bible says his purpose was the Son of God manifested to destroy the works of the devil. So Satan tried to frustrate the purpose of Jesus by compromise. When the Lord was baptized in the river of Jordan going into the wilderness of temptation, Satan said, I see the road ahead of you. You, 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 you know, you, you have a long road that you're traveling on. All you got to do now is just, you know, come on, bow down before me. Take a shortcut. I'll give you all the kingdoms of the world. Caught Jesus while he was hungry after fasting for 40 days. And, you know, you can, if you bow down before me, you can have everything. You're hungry? Don't wait until you come out of this wilderness and go somewhere and sit at a table and break your fast. Here's a stone. Go ahead. Make yourself some bread to eat. Uh-huh, you got the power. Uh, but, you know, also over here on the, when he went to the mountaintop and he said, I already, yeah, I know it's already written, written that here you see the kingdoms of the world and all of these things belong to you. But if you bow down to me one moment, I'll give them to you. Took them to the pinnacle of the temple and said, you know, if you are who you say you are, all you got to do is just jump down. He's given the angels charge over you. Just go ahead and jump down. They'll catch you. And I tell you one thing, the devil will frustrate you and try to get you into doing something stupid. Get you to take a shortcut. But I'm here to let you know that any purpose that is worth having is going to take a little time. Somebody say time. This day, you know, uh, when you've got this in this day, you've got to go and get all the education that you can. And I've come to realize that by our pastor and superintendent kind of casually nudging me saying, yeah, I need to go to school, yeah, I need to go to school, yeah, I need to go to school. Yeah, you know, it'd be wonderful if we go to school. So <laughs> I've come to realize that you've got to get all the education that you possibly can. And when your life is a life of continuing education, you have to continue to get more and more. Amen? Uh, you've got to go back. And, you know, get your, get your bachelor's degree and go back and get your master's degree and go back and get your doctorate. And then go back and say, well, I need to learn more about these here computers and I need to learn more and more. And what it is about your purpose is you've got to accomplish it. Accomplish it. The devil tried his best to frustrate Jesus even at the last minute. The flesh was weak. Jesus knew that the next day the cross and the purpose for which he had come into the world will be, will be there on Mount Calvary. But I hear him saying for just a moment, Father, if it's possible, is there another way? If so, let this cup pass from me. But even in this moment of frustration, he didn't stay there and entertain it long. Nevertheless, it's not my will, but thy will be done. Okay. The enemy will try and frustrate your purpose, but you got to understand that what God has given you is your purpose and what your purpose is to live this life. You know, I knew, you know, I knew all throughout my life growing up what my purpose was, you know, um, and some might say it was like Jeremiah. When Jeremiah was a young man and was approached by God to prophesy to the people of Israel, he said, no, I'm too young. I'm just a child. And the Lord said, no. He said, before I formed you in the belly, I knew you and I ordained you a prophet to the nations. And, I, and what I want you to know is you were born for a divine purpose. Somebody say purpose. I don't know what your purpose is, but you've got to lay hold to it early. 
you know, you've got to do what it is that God has called you into this world to do. And as you prepare for it, don't let anything stop you. One way that you can make your purpose clearer is you got to know why every creature was born. According to the book of Isaiah, the Lord said, I created you for my glory. I formed you. I made you. You know, anybody that's not praising God is not fulfilling their purpose. I don't care how many degrees you have. If you are too smart to give God praise, then you need to go back to school. If you're too smart to give God praise, the one that formed you in the womb of your mother, that brought you forth into this world, and everything that you're doing, every measure of success that you have, is only because God has giving you a mind. All, right. All he's got to do is just snap his finger. You won't even know your name. Every one of us, our purpose is to praise God. And I don't care what you have achieved. Don't you give yourself the credit. Because it's God that has given you a mind. It's God that worked in you both to do and to fulfill his good pleasure. And I'm determined that it doesn't matter how the enemy tries. Uh -huh. He will not frustrate my purpose. Uh -huh. yeah. My purpose is to lift up the name of Jesus. Jesus. To tell a dying world Jesus. that he is the one. Yes, He's the one that died on the cross for my yes, sins. Lord. He's the one that filled me with the yes, spirit. Lord. And told me to go into the world and Jesus. preach his gospel. Yes, Men and women may not want to receive it. But preach it anyhow. Yes, tell it in the White House. Tell it on the street corner. Tell it everywhere you go that Jesus is Lord. That he is the one that will bring you through any situation. You may go through the valley in the shadow of death, but I hear him say I'm with you. I don't know what's going on in your life, but you ought to tell somebody my purpose is to give God praise. And I'm not going to let it get frustrated. I'm not going to let the devil turn me around. I'm not going to let friends and associates turn me around. I stop by here to tell you that your purpose transcends them. That's why you got to stop tripping on people that you lose in your life and that walk out of your life. It has nothing to do with people, your purpose. And God said, I'm putting you in earth to manifest your purpose. And when I put you in earth to manifest your purpose, ain't no hater, no jealous person, no evildoer, no backbiter, no backstabber, no underminer, no manipulator. Can't nobody take the purpose uh, that God has put you in this earth to fulfill us and that's why me and you can shout all things uh, work together for good uh, that those that love God uh, and those that are called according to your purpose uh, not by your mama not by your daddy not by your friends uh, not by anybody else uh, but those that are called uh, according to your purpose uh, and I got a purpose uh, Lift up the name of Jesus. My purpose is to give Jesus all the praise. My purpose is to give Jesus all of my worship. Because I will bless the Lord at all times. And his praises shall continually be in my mouth. I'm not going to let what people may say frustrate my purpose. I've got to praise him. I'm going to praise him in the dance. I'm going to praise him in the song. I'm going to praise him while I preach. And I'm going to praise him while I live. I'm going to live a life that shows that I know Jesus. I know him. And he died and was crucified for my sins. I stop by here to let you know that you got purpose. You have purpose. Don't let anybody frustrate your purpose. They may try to stab you in the back, but you got purpose. You made it here in this house for your purpose. You made it here to give God praise. This is the time to give God praise. I came to let you know, those of you that are at home, 
Yes. Nice. 